There are no small players in this. That's what's unbelievable about this production. Because it made me cry not once, but twice. It's the thing you least expect. You just feel honored to be a part of. I know that sounds a bit cheesy. As soon as it was sent my way, it was like a complete um, no brainer. And to be honest, just a joy. What are you doing here, Etty? He's coming, isn't he? Yeah. I think there's a misconception about Morpheus as, I, I, he certainly is brooding and dark, um, but I think there's a misconception that his, that his isolationism and his withdrawn um, sort of contained qualities are uh, because he doesn't feel. I, I think that he, in containing inside of him the unconsciousness of the universe and containing inside of him all of our, every sentient beings dreams he knows exactly how each and every one of us feels and therefore i think it is an extraordinary empathetic uh, being but the discipline required to hold that energy inside of him and avoid the catastrophe that sort of that, that miscontrolling it would cause means that he has to be rigorous and controlled um, but I do think that inside him, there's this extraordinary um, vivacity and, and life. Yeah, I mean, so, so, I mean, similar to Doctor Who in terms of we explore many uh, worlds, realms, states, travel, but um, yeah, I mean, so, so distinctive. I mean, I was very, I, I, it's very, we're talking very much about how hard it is to describe someone. It's so distinctive and so, um, Unique, and as soon as and, and Neil Gaiman, I'm obviously such a such a fan of. So as soon as it was sent my way, it was like a complete um, no brainer. And to be honest, just a joy. Like the character is so formed on the page, so complex. Uh, I like I like her. Like she's she's hilarious, and like un, she's unlike other characters that I've played before. And and she's cynical, and she's dry, and she's there's a lot of emotional complexity going on. Um, She's a she's a lone warrior in the world and tortured and wounded, but uh, but hilarious and uh, pragmatic, um, and obviously getting to play Lady Joanna Constantine as well, and kind of having the the link between those two characters, but also being uh, relatives. But but Lady Joanna Constantine having a very different kind of cold, cunning. Uh, calculation um, and a very different relationship, I think, with um, with Dream as well. It's, um, no, I, I think it, it's one of the real pleasures of, of the way television and, and film have developed in the last 20 years is that you do get these really exciting projects that, that you just feel honored to be a part of. I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but uh, the, the Sandman is for, for, for most people one of the masterpieces in, in graphic novels of the past 30, 40 years. And I was, because I've known Neil for some time, I know how much it means to him and how much it meant to get it right, you know, there was, uh, it, it reminded me of how my friend Douglas Adams, uh, with his Hitchhiker's Guide, if only he had lived another 10 years, they, they really could have done it properly. <laughs> the technology, but not just the technology, the budget and the will to make things properly and give them due care and attention is, is at a high pitch at the moment. And so it's a kind of easy call, I found. The only reason we even exist is to serve them. I think I'd have to point to the whole of episode six because it made me cry. And because it made me cry not once, but twice. Once during the death scene when we meet Harry and once right at the end of Men of Good Fortune when Death and Hob get together in the pub. And that took me by surprise each time. I'm sitting there thinking, I wrote these words. I plotted this out in 1988. This has been part of my life, these stories, ever since. I read and reread them every time I had to, you know, we reprinted them or I was checking the color or anything like that. I know them like the back of my hand. And yet watching this thing that we've shot is bypassing all the thinking bits of my brain and is going straight into the emotion bits and I can't believe that's happening. And there was so much pride 
in what Alan, in what the actors had done, in in every part of that. I mean, you look at the the pub every hundred years and look at you know production designers, costume designers, and costume makers. Everybody came in to give us that for what, in the end of the day, is about half an hour of television. We shouldn't have been able to do that, and we did. What Kirby uh, Hal Baptiste brings to death in just making you go, oh yes, when I die, I hope you're there. You'll make things better. It'll be okay. Um, that thing, I'm, you know, I don't care that it took us a thousand auditions to get to Kirby because we got Kirby at the end and it's like, okay, that thing is the thing that we wanted. That feeling of speaking truth, that feeling of being the person at the end that you love and you care for, the person you would like to imagine was there for your child, for your parent, for your sibling, for your loved one at the end. I thought about giving up, but I have a job to do and I do it. Well, what I think is beautiful about all of um, our episodes is whether you see a character for a single episode or for multiple, these, each of these episodes stands alone. They're almost like short films. So, you know, there are no small players in this. It's not, it's absolutely not about screen time in something like this. There is a magnitude and a weight to every single character that is in the Sandman and fans of the Sandman will know that. And new fans, people who have figured out Sandman through this show will see that, that every single character, no matter how long you see them, has such weight. So to me, it is a case of absolute quality over quantity. And thinking about uh, the representation of, of Lucifer, I mean, like Kirby's been saying about portraying death, it's a concept, you know, Lucifer is the epitome of evil. Mm -hmm. But for me, what the comics did so beautifully was that they presented uh, a very human quality. So you believed that was a person, you could see it, you could see all the complexities and the conflicts, the internal conflicts, the, the wonderful thing that Neil does so well, which he just turns things on their head. It's, it's the thing you least expect. And, um, I wanted to be really, we all did, wanted to be really faithful to the comics, but at the same time, it was thrilling to be able to actually bring my interpretation, what, what the comics had given me, what had fired in my imagination through reading them, through talking to Neil, looking at Neil's original source material, and also looking at my own range of material. And Lucifer's a part I played before on stage um, years ago, and I'd always wanted to revisit it. So this was like a kind of glorious opportunity to explore something about evil, which is extremely relevant in our modern world. Tell us what power of dreams in hell. No, but it really was. That, 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 that's what's unbelievable about this production is that is that everything, I mean, and, and, you know, beyond the impossible was built. Like those, I mean, so I, the first thing that came to my head was hell. Mm. It was extraordinary to be inside Lucifer's um, layer. And, you know, that floor was stone. Those columns were marble. The murals were painted on the walls. The fire burnt your face. And, you know, it's such a difficult thing when you do a job like this, the, 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 the kind of the leaps of imagination that are required. And, and what was so special was that the production design team uh, and everyone involved made those leaps so much smaller than they needed to be because they made it. Um, and yeah, I mean, the first thing that came into my head was hell. Um, and uh, there wasn't genuinely, I don't think one piece of, of, of green screen in that sequence that I worked with. Um, other than like maybe sitting outside a window or something. Um, and that was just, it's just, it's a, it's incredibly easy to tell the truth when mm. you can touch the truth. Yeah, it's a gift, it's really amazing. In my case, selfishly, because we, we, we went, we were down in Surrey, I think it was, in a sort of quarry for the, for the, one of the final scenes of episode 10 where, where I get 
turned into something that is a spoiler alert. <laughs> and um, and it was in it was on one of the hottest days we had that year. It's not the hottest day. And as you probably notice, I wear entirely green thick tweed, uh, waistcoat, coat, and cape, and hat, and moustache, mm-hmm. and I. It was very hard to think of anything other than wanting to dive into an ice bath. So the 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 the, the secret is is oh the agony, gentlemen, ladies, the agony of having to perform. <laughs> didn't you find that? But we coped, didn't we? Because we had very kind people giving us fans. But you and you had some great locations to work in as well. Yeah. Um, we I, the first location that we filmed at um, on my first day which was uh, the scene where we arrived in England um, to see Unity. And it was a gorgeous, gorgeous big building. And I think that was just, it was so nice to just like look at it. I love old buildings. So it was just a right, real treat. I just had the weirdest dream. Mm-hmm.